Well, okay, welcome everybody. Just double checking, looks good. And welcome to our webinar here. Uh, kind greetings, uh, one and all. Uh, and welcome to day three of Loyola's sixth annual climate change conference. My name is, um, is Michael Murphy, and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola University Chicago. And on behalf of university leadership, uh, on behalf of Dean Nancy Tuckman from the School of Environmental Sustainability, uh, with whom we've had the pleasure to work from the very beginning, and all of our friends there, um, and on behalf of the Hank family, whose generous endowment funds our, our many endeavors, uh, I extend a warm Loyola greeting. I also extend a greeting on behalf of our excellent center staff, our office manager, Patty Delgado, and our graduate uh, research assistant, Adam High, both of who are uh, always um, supporting this work and doing all kinds of engineering stuff as we speak. Um, so thank, thanks to all. Uh, this conference is hosted by the School of Environmental Sustainability in collaboration with a broad community of partners, thinkers, legislators, advocates, and practitioners of climate health and indeed care of creation. Uh, this week, uh, and every week at Loyola, if we're honest, we address the intersection of climate change, human health, and justice. In that spirit, our session tonight is called Unequal Impact, Environmental Racism and Faith-Based Resources in Restorative Justice. For it is self-evident uh, that climate change and the need for restorative justice are deeply connected from workers' rights to land use, to pollutant loads in neighborhoods and in rural areas. People of color and the poor are exposed to far greater environmental health hazards than others. Our excellent panel will speak on these matters tonight and, and much more. And as always, we invite you to join the conversation. Uh, on that note, some basic housekeeping as they say, and a word about our format uh, before I introduce our speakers and we can begin our session. The Zoomcast is called, is a webinar and we're all old pros by now. Um, and this means that uh, while the chat is disabled, uh, you can ask questions certainly using the Q&A function and even make comments in that space as well. Uh, and we'll respond. Uh, so you utilize that Q&A tab and I encourage you as always to listen actively and if something occurs to you, just write it down and put it in the, uh, the Q&A. And uh, we will, uh, I promise as facilitator, I will get to as many as I, as I possibly can because you know, the more voices, the better. Uh, with that, let's welcome our speakers. Uh, the bios here are a bit shorter and you can check the fuller descriptions uh, in our web pages uh, at the Hank Center site on, on Loyola. So we welcome Dr. Sylvia Hood Washington, uh, Chief Environmental Research Scientist at Environmental Health Research Associates, Associates, pardon me, LLC, and a most successful environmental epidemiologist, environmental engineer, and environmental historian and clinician with over 30 years of research experience working precisely on our topics, the impact of industrial pollution, human health, and justice questions. Uh, Dr. Dr. Sylvia, as she, as she prefers to be called, which I think is great, uh, successfully implemented Research Conservation and Recovery Act, RCRA, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Superfund and National Environmental Policy Act, the NEPA, all these kinds of regulations for effluents and solid waste derived from power generation sources, spaces and terrestrial systems, for both private industry and NASA. Dr. Sylvia is a published author. Uh, the book I first was aware when I her on my radar was called Packing Them In, an archeology span of environmental racism in Chicago, 1865 to 1954. That book's from 2005. There's also Echoes from a Poisoned Well, an edited volume, which has um, maybe 20 writers in it. Um, I have it here. Um, and that's from 2006, uh, Echoes from the Poisoned Well, Global Memories of Environmental Injustice. Um, Dr. Sylvia is also creator and editor in chief of the first international environmental health disparities journal called Environmental Justice, and really so much more, so much more to share about her life. So please see our web pages. 
Our second speaker, we're so glad that uh, Chanel Robinson uh, accepted our invitation. Chanel is a doctoral student in systematic theology at Boston College, our sister Jesuit university to the East. And her scholarship explores womanist theology and theological anthropology. An educator and scholar, Chanel completed a Master of Arts in Theological Studies and a Master of Teaching at the University of Toronto. She is the recipient of uh, doctoral fellowships through the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, the SSHRC, and the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. Welcome, Chanel. Good to see you. And finally, our friend Jose Aguto, uh, the Executive Director of the Catholic Climate Covenant, such an important uh, organization that Jose is leading so beautifully. This, uh, the CCC, the Catholic Climate Covenant, animates the church's call for us to care for God's creation and our vulnerable neighbors as integral dimensions of the Catholic faith. Before joining the covenant, Jose worked for the Friends Committee on National Legislation, the National Congress of American Indians, and EPA's American Indian Environmental Office. Jose graduated from Brown University and Villanova Law School and served with the U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division. I'd like to welcome all of our speakers uh, to, the, to the Zoom stage and welcome you all here, Zoom viewer, to Unequal Impact, Environmental Racism and Faith-Based Resources in Restorative Justice. With that, Dr. Sylvia, the Zoom podium is yours. Welcome, my friend. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, Can we see the screen? All right. I just want to minimize this. So I wanted to start off with just this clip, uh, this cartoon. Um, this came out right when Laudato C was launched. And so you can see this comrade, he says, we need to protect the earth. This is like a common discourse among environmentalists. We need to protect the earth and the land and the rivers. But then we have Pope Francis saying, yeah, the heavens and the seas. And here's what I like. And the, I'm sorry. Uh, that just. Okay. But he also says that we want to protect the unborn. And so environmental racism and environmental justice, specifically when it was emerging uh, as a concept in the United States was really focused on the health of individuals who were marginalized. And so the environmental movement that began with Rachel Carson, it also talks about humans, but the environmental justice movement and this cry about environmental racism is about the human being not being protected in the environment. And this actually is addressed in Laudato Si and also my work, which Michael mentioned. So in Laudato Si, the Pope clearly says, some forms of pollution are part of people's daily experience. And they're constantly being exposed to atmospheric pollution, um, pollution of the water, pollution of soil, but it all yields these health impacts on human beings. So what we're talking about is human beings being resilient, human lives, having sustainable environments. And so that is the goal of fighting against environmental racism because these communities have found that they are not in a resilient space. They are not living in an environment where their, their bodies are being protected. And this is a right to life issue because if we're talking about protecting the unborn, then we have to not just protect the unborn from abortion, we actually have to, uh, to protect the unborn and small children from pollution and what is doing to their bodies while they're being developed in the womb and outside of the womb. So in Glodato C, he clearly states that pollution affects everyone and they're in, they'll be imp impacted by fertilizers, insecticides, fungicides, and just pollution in the atmosphere. Just last week, a major, major study came out and said that redlining, 
which started in the 1930s, has resulted in over 45 million Americans breathing dirtier air. 50 years after this process was ended. And what does that mean, redlining? In the 1930s, certain communities were, were, were rated based on who lived there, who was living there. And African-Americans and Latinos and immigrants were put into neighborhoods that were graded at a low level. So you had A that was best, and then you had B that was hazardous. And most people of color and most poor people were put into that hazardous graded area. And so what we're seeing now in terms of the science is that if you were in the A category, which more than likely you were white and rich. Now I'll say white and rich, because if you're white and poor, <laughs> you're also subjected to environmental inequalities. So now one of the determinants of health, environmental health, is the presence of nitrous dioxide pollution. So we can see at A, which would be white, that we have very little nitrous dioxide pollution. But if you're a person of color, the curve looks very different. So <laughs> people of color and poor people are now having a large percentage of their population living in areas with this nitrous dioxide. So who you are based on your race and your socioeconomic status has actually made you more at risk and living 50 years later in a much more toxic environment. That's environmental racism, right? It's, this is not just some um, social cry, though that's social issues are important. This is a health issue. Um, and this is uh, a situation which will lead to death uh, because the article, which is brilliant, it was an article in New York Times as well as the Washington Post, but that was released last week. But the bottom line in both of these studies is that if you are poor and you are a minority, that your health is at serious risk um, and that you're gonna have a higher probability of dying. There's nothing equitable about that. Uh, that is not something that we should want as people of faith and we should want just utter common decency. So just as we have air pollution, <laughs> the unfortunate part about these communities who live in these communities of environmental injustice is that it's not only just your air, but it's your water. And so Laudato, Laudato C, the Pope makes it very clear that having access to safe drinking water is a universal right, universal human right. And over seven years ago, we saw what happened in Flint, Michigan. When children were subjected to higher levels of lead. Now, what does that mean um, when we're subjected or exposed to this? Now, this is a lifetime, as I said before, environmental racism is a right to life issue because we are talking about consumption to death. And so when a child is exposed to high levels of lead, what does it do? It causes problems with brain development, reduced IQ, behavioral changes um, that can lead to seizures and neurological damage, um, kidney problems, uh, anemia, hypertension. This is a lifelong struggle that's introduced to this child in the womb when they're drinking this water. This is what we're talking about in terms of human resiliency. Um, so we do not, as Catholics, again, as people of faith, want to contribute to the degradation. We don't want to contribute to the um, premature illnesses, death of fellow human beings. And this is just by where they live. And where they live has been determined by our political 
and social um, policies of restricting them into um, harmful environments. At the beginning of my slide, I showed the wolf of Gooby. I'm a secular Francis, Franciscan. And I love that story of the wolf of Gubbio because in that story, St. Francis comes in and the town is in uh, battle with this wolf that they concede, uh, they perceive as a very violent, destructive creature until you understand that their encroachment of his space, his environment has led to him being violent. Lead actually contributes to individuals becoming violent if you do some deep research on that. So here we have, like the Wolf of Gubbio, people who are forced into these unsustainable spaces and not being able to live and to have a sustainable environment because of the choices that were made for them and about them. So, what is the commitment of the, of the Catholic Church to environmental justice, to this right to life issue? And I think that that's what I had wanted to focus on today because when we had our discussions before this, this day uh, among the group, it was like, but Catholics really haven't been involved with environmental justice. In my experience is that, yes, you have. The, the USCCB has been very much involved with environmental justice in the United States. And in 2002, after my own personal experiences with um, seeing environmental inequalities, not only academically, but actually um, my own, how can I put it, <laughs> my own boots on the ground experience with environmental justice communities, I actually went to the USCCB on behalf of the Knights of Peter Claver to ask for support to develop educational materials that would inform um, African-American Catholics about these issues of environmental justice. And the reason why I did that was because even until, even now we have the same type of situation where environmental justice communities, which have done a fantastic job of shedding light about these environmental inequalities, environmental health inequalities, that message was not being communicated to, communicated to African-American Catholics uh, because they were not in the same venues. And so the USCCB in 2002 uh, decided to fund the Knights of Peter Claver with, um, um, with resources to actually communicate to that population what was environmental justice and why they should be concerned. At that time, the Clavers, the Knights of Peter Clavers were in 39 states with over 300 courts and councils for adults and over 100 junior, junior uh, branches for, for children between the ages of eight and 18. I presented with a team uh, this effort of making sure that environmental justice was understood by this population so that they could make choices um, about whether they should continue to be in their current environment, how to be proactive in those environments. The primary objective of the grant was to promote environmental justice and environmental health literacy uh, in the Black Catholic urban populations initially in the northeastern part of the United States, Region 5, which Chicago was included in. Um, the modern environmental justice movement actually began around 1982. And again, that, that movement was about a disproportionate burden of environmental health costs from pollution uh, sources. So let me just say this much about environmental justice when it was first articulated. They were talking about not just noxious smells, they were talking about spontaneous abortions, they were talking about higher rates of cancer, um, they were talking about a destruction of human life, um, a, a uh, marginalization of those communities. And as I pointed in my previous slides, a destruction of fetuses 
uh, children who are brain damaged, children who cannot function, will have learning disabilities and who become violent. So that was the, the original thrust. And I think, I think that's still the thrust of these communities, that their bodies from conception to death have been marginalized. And so the USCCB, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, through their Environmental Justice Office, heard our cry. <laughs> they heard us. Um, we presented to them in Washington, D.C. And while Grazier, who is the director of the USCCB's Environmental Justice Office, along with Roxana Barillas, uh, who is the director of the USCCB's Catholic Coalition for Children and Safe and Environment, they met with us. Uh, talked to us between April 2002 and October 2002 to discuss this issue about environmental justice and to talk about it in the, in the lens of a pro-life movement. And again, that grant emerged because of my research and my personal experience. And I'm gonna say this as well. So environmental justice to me, when I first encountered the concept of environmental racism was something that I grew up with, right? So I'm not gonna tell you my age, but I will tell you this, I grew up in Ohio. And when I grew up, this was in the uh, age of de facto segregation. Schools were segregated, communities were segregated. My mother was a, a civil, uh, she was a, uh, a very much um, a civic activist. And that cry about pollution being put in minority communities, that was just a repetitive and a consistent cry of community activists in the Black communities. And this was in a middle-class Black community. And they were still talking about polychlorinated biphenols being dumped in their neighborhoods and unregulated. So after working with uh, Grazier and Varillas at the USCCB, it was decided that they would give us a grant um, that would be focused on educating young people. Um, we wanted to promote environmental justice literacy among young African-American Catholics between the ages of 15 to 21. And that is what we did. And we were fortunate to have uh, the support of the uh, Catholic Theological Union, uh, Dr. Don's sister and Dr. Don Knopfler. Um, we also work with the um, Chicago His uh, History Society, um, Historical Society, and all of that led to the production of educational materials grounded in Catholic theology. Um, initially, we created a booklet um, that was disseminated. And then we, um, and 3,000 copies of that booklet, a booklet was actually um, disseminated across uh, the Northern region of the United States. Um, and the booklets were produced and um, disseminated by DePaul University. And they were also sent out to over 250 environmental uh, NGOs and also um, to environmental agencies in both in Chicago and in the Illinois region. So we were then fortunate enough to get another grant for $50,000 in 2004, as well as $10,000 uh, that was, uh, we were awarded from the Illinois Humanities Council, um, and then $3,000 from the um, the uh, Vincentian Endowment Fund from DePaul. That last set of funding was, was to do a very um, important task of creating an environmental justice film um, to train our, our teams um, so that people would have a clear, un, a clear understanding in a visual way of what environmental justice was all about why dealing with environmental justice was fundamental to our faith. The destruction of the human body is not what uh, we want to see as human beings, but especially as Catholics. 
Um, there is a certain amount of conscious and unconscious efforts uh, to ignore that this issue um, has been around for decades, I would say centuries, if you look at uh, Echoes from the Poison Well, it's global. Um, but I am, I am so fortunate to be witness uh, to the USCCB uh, taking up this issue of environmental justice. That was 20 years ago that they committed to doing this. Uh, 20 years ago that they understood that environmental racism, environmental injustice was a right to life issue. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful to Michael Murphy <laughs> for inviting me and working with me. And he has a surprise for you at the end of this discussion to actually elucidate the fact that um, Catholics, Roman Catholics, and you know, even though Pope Francis doesn't have every page <laughs> dedicated to environmental justice, what he does say in Laudato Si is that the dignity of, uh, of human beings is paramount and that the destruction of the planet includes the destruction of human beings. And that that, that, that discussion in Laudato Si uh, I took out a lot because I wanted to, 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 to give Chanel and others this, uh, the, an opportunity to talk about these issues, but our faith teaches us that the destruction of life from conception to death is not what we believe in. And our project with the USCCB is a testimony that they understood that the destruction of human life not just from abortion, but the destruction of human life from the chemicals that we produce in our industrialized society is leading to this destruction of human life. They recognized that, they funded that, and they wanted to educate people about that. And that was disseminated across the United States. That, alt that film was ultimately distributed, uh, distributed across the United States. And this is where I would like to end and let Chanel begin her discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hood Washington, Dr. Sylvia for that rich, rich presentation. And I look forward to unpacking it later on. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Chanel Robinson, and I'm so excited to be with you today. I want to begin by thanking Dr. Michael Murphy and the Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage for inviting me to participate in this panel. I, many thanks to my fellow panelists. I look forward to learning from you tonight. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that I'm calling in today from the traditional lands of the Wampanoag and Massachusetts peoples. This evening, we meditate on the renewed possibilities in which we might enter as a church family and also as inhabitants of the earth. In this brief presentation, I will examine points of connection between Laudato Si's proposals and eco-womanism. And I will conclude with reflections on eco-memory um, by recalling the story of the historical African-Canadian settlement known as Africville. Pope Francis's 2015 encyclical Laudato Si invites us to rethink how humanity is inextricably connected with the planet. He develops an understanding of integral ecology that interweaves the entire cosmic community. Throughout the letter addressed to the entire human family, Pope Francis reminds us of how marginalized communities, especially the poor, experience disenfranchisement alongside the earth. Francis details, quote, the intimate relationship between the poor and the fragility of the planet, the conviction that everything in the world is connected, unquote. The parallel between these two experiences prompts a rereading of the ecological crisis as inseparable from social justice. His use of the phrase the poor, however, might be nuanced through an engagement with theological traditions that attend to the complexity and interlocking facets of human identity. 
In particular, the project of eco-womanism might function as a generative site for reconsidering care for our earthly home with the needs of black and brown and indigenous communities in mind. As a lens for analyzing the ecological crisis, eco-womanism is an interdisciplinary framework that gleans wisdom from indigenous knowledge forms and uplifts the experiences of Black women and interrogates issues like environmental racism. According to African-American ethicist Melanie Harris, quote, methodologically, eco-womanist approaches use womanist, Black feminist, race, class, gender analysis that consistently looks through a lens that exposes tripartite oppressions imposed by systems of white supremacy and racial privilege that attempt to negate the lives, innate worth, value, and dignity of Black women and communities of color, unquote. Furthermore, Canadian scholar Ingrid Waldron notes that, quote, environmental racism, a subset of the larger environmental justice movement that originated in the United States, refers to environmental policies, practices, and directives that disproportionately disadvantage individuals, groups, or communities, intentionally or unintentionally, based on race or color, unquote. Issues of environmental racism must be considered theological problems. Eco-womanism combines the concerns of ecology, focusing on the entangled reality of the created order, and womanism, a term coined by Alice Walker in her 1983 text, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. Eco-womanism roots itself in the lived experiences of women of African descent. It recognizes the intersectionality that shapes human life on this planet. Both Laudato Si and eco-womanism might function as helpful dialogue partners as we seek to navigate and survive the unfolding ecological catastrophe. Both disclose the contours of what Harris describes as, quote, earth honoring faith, unquote. By situating care for creation within the scope of Catholic social teaching, Pope Francis reminds us of the expansive implications of the common good, which extend beyond humanity to include the earth. Furthermore, in paragraph 91, the Pope states that, quote, a sense of deep communion with the rest of nature cannot be real if our hearts lack tenderness, compassion, and concern for our fellow human beings. It is clearly inconsistent to combat trafficking in endangered species while remaining completely indifferent to human trafficking. I'm concerned about the poor or undertaking to destroy another human being deemed unwanted. This compromises the very meaning of our struggle for the sake of the environment. Everything is connected. Concern for the environment thus needs to be joined to a sincere love for our fellow human beings and an unwavering commitment to resolving the problems of society." Unquote. It is also important to remember the communities who are discarded in the midst of ecological degradation. Black, brown, and indigenous communities are often made to live in close proximity to dumping grounds filled with toxins. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis acknowledges that, quote, the human environment and the natural environment deteriorate together. We cannot adequately combat environmental degradation unless we attend to causes related to human and social degradation. In fact, the deterioration of the environment and of society affects the most vulnerable people on the planet, unquote. And this recognition of the interconnection between oppressed communities and the earth, memory could be understood as a powerful resource for exposing instances of environmental racism. I want us to watch now this very brief clip that recalls the memory of Africville in Nova Scotia, Canada. Where the pavement ended, Africville began. There have been black people in Halifax as long as there's been a Halifax. They helped build the city, 
formerly enslaved people and free black men and women, maroons. Together, they dug out its roads and raised its roof beams. Facing racism in town, black people settled at the city limits. They built homes and started families. They set up their own school and other services the city refused to provide. They built the Seaview United Baptist Church, the beating heart of the community. Despite paying city taxes, Africvillians had no running water, electricity, paved roads, or sewers. Instead, the city built factories, sewage pits, and a prison nearby, then labeled the village a slum. In 1962, Halifax City Council voted to demolish Africville, taking its valuable land for industrial development. The bulldozers arrived as Africville lay sleeping. By 1970, the neighborhood was destroyed and its residents forcibly relocated to other Halifax neighborhoods. But Africville was home to the people who lived there and they would not be forgotten. Once a year, we venture out to Africville for a reunion. Set up your tent, set up your camp, or throw a blanket on the grass. The children are playing, people are laughing and hugging, reminiscing about the old days. But for three days, you have your community back. Eco-memories interrupt our collective apathy. They prompt us to reorder ourselves. Africville operates as a dangerous eco-memory. African-Canadian communities who created life, raised families on the neglected periphery of Nova Scotia's shores were later expelled from this site. They were uprooted from a place that they called home. Exploitation of the land and violence against Black communities often happen concurrently. Harris notes that, quote, eco-memory is a form of counter-memory that reconstitutes traditional environmental history that too often overlooks or ignores the voices, experiences, and histories of Black peoples. Instead, eco-memory begins from the central point of Black and African life and centers the perspectives, voices and experiences of African peoples. Mining eco-memory simultaneously pushes back critiquing traditional forms of environmental history that leave out the histories of people of color, unquote. Eco-memory corrects. It corrects the mis misremembering of ecological histories. Similarly, the eco-memory of Africville spurs a rethinking of Canada's environmental legacy. The asymmetries of power that reinforce human superiority over the land map themselves onto the displacement of racialized communities into polluted areas, which is both a social and a theological problem. Laudato Si discusses memory in this way, quote, our insistence that each human being is an image of God should not make us overlook the fact that each creature has its own purpose. The entire material universe speaks of God's love, his boundless affection for us. Soil, water, mountains, everything is, as it were, a caress of God. The history of our friendship with God is always linked to particular places which take on an intensely personal meaning. We all remember places, and revisiting those memories does us much good, unquote. Memory can act as a place-based praxis. Memory is also a potent theological resource. For Catholic theologian Dr. M. Sean Copeland, quote, solidarity begins in an anamnesis which intentionally remembers and invokes the Black victims of history, martyrs for freedom. Solidarity affirms the interconnectedness of human beings and common creatureliness. Human beings are intrinsically, metaphysically, and electively connected, unquote. Memory counters radical individualism, 
Wholeness and solidarity also emerge from memory. Memory prompts the urgency to embrace people who experience oppression alongside the earth as kin. As we think through and pray through the ecological crisis, we must remember the communities who are often directly impacted. I want to close with the reading of a poem by a Nova Scotian poet named David Woods, and it's entitled The New Chapter for Africville. Sometimes in the flood of words, I return to the black houses, tar paper shacks in solemn lives, walking the old stone road. Big town, southwestern, round the turn. Sacred spots on the map and new routes in my voyage of discovery. I fork through gray shale, blood pines, into the sooty landscape not yet mastered by my hands, climbing the steep hilltop to peer into the village life below, to see a yellow house opened like a womb, and Aunt Ruth still there awaiting my return to continue her tale of lives that swerve through the mist outside or walk magically alongside the train tracks that since her death flood my pen like blood. Thank you. Josue Aguto, I invite you to share with us. Oh my gosh, Chanel, thank you for that moving testimony and that poem. Um, and an absolute privilege to be on this panel, um, also with uh, Dr. Sylvia and Thank you for your, your wisdom as well. Um, and thank you, Michael, for the blessing of being here today. Um, I will keep my remarks relatively brief. I have three points to make. Um, first um, um, is to um, help amplify or, or supplement the comments that have been made with regard to environmental justice and to per help perhaps provide you with some pointers on how to speak with other Catholics and Christians who may not be familiar with care for creation and environmental justice. Second is to talk about some of the more recent efforts within the Catholic Church to address environmental justice. And thirdly, what you can do, um, what we can do to continue uh, with this fight uh, and this struggle. And I'm gonna start first with uh, the very basics of the foundations of our faith. Because as GK Chesterton said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. And no more so today in all that we're doing in our world and all that is happening in our world, do we need to step into this difficult yet largely untried Christian ideal. And what is that Christian ideal? And many of us know this and many of us and all of us need to continue practicing it with ever greater fervor. And that is the greatest commandment to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so when we think of God, we must also think of God as the creator, for he is mentioned as the creator in the first sentence of the Bible and the first sentence of the Nicene Creed, where he is the maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible. And so if he is the creator and he has created that which he has freely given to us, then ought not we love that ought not we do good and honor and steward that which he gave us and not impose dominion upon it so to love god is to love creation and saint pope john paul ii said and this is saint pope john paul ii and i'm not talking about uh, um, pope francis at this time he said that care for creation is the central part of our faith and he was the one who called for a global ecological conversion. So in many ways, Pope Francis is, is standing on the shoulders of those beautiful people who came before him. The second dimension of love your neighbor as yourself would then call racism a fundamental dereliction of that commandment. Because if you are treating another in a degrading way based on the color of their skin or based on their gender or any other way, then you are not loving your neighbor as yourself. And so 
racism is a fundamental contradiction to that call. So if you take both aspects of the greatest commandment to love God, the creator, and to love your neighbor as yourself, then environmental injustice is a two-pronged violation of the greatest commandment. En environmental justice then, as, um, as was said earlier, is a pro-life issue. And therefore we must seek environmental justice in our hopes and in our mission to hold the life and dignity of every single human person as sacred. Second, what is the engagement of the church? And uh, thank you, Dr. Sylvia, for bringing some of, the, um, some of this uh, to light. Um, and to follow up, um, USCCB's um, CCHD, Campaign for Human Development, has invested nearly $2.5 million and partnered with over 35 community-based organizations and 31 dioceses in 22 states to support environmental justice. Um, and that would include, for example, supporting Destiny Watford, um, who was awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2016 to stop the construction of the largest incinerator in the country in her neighborhood in Curtis Bay in Baltimore City. CCHD has also awarded, has also awarded funds to Sharon Levine and her organization, Rise St. James. And Sharon was awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2021 for her efforts to keep a petrochemical plant, Formosa, from being cited in her neighborhood, uh, in her parish in Louisiana. And she's, her community is already surrounded by 11 such polluting plants. In 2017, after the Charlottesville riots, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops created an ad hoc committee on racism. And then we're also seeing efforts within the diocese of Stockton, Sacramento, St. Louis, and Joliet to engage actively in environmental justice issues. And the diocese of Stockton has been doing so for many, many years, working particularly with the Hispanic community to prevent environmental justice um, and poisoning of their community. Uh, I would also mention, and I imagine there are other universities such as Loyola who are doing some work um, at Creighton University and their Schlegel Center for Service and Justice. They have been doing environmental justice tours, meeting with the residents and a people of color community in Northern Omaha, which has been subjected to contamination due to a coal fire power plant and they also then dialogue with the officials of this coal-fired power plant to figure out ways in which they can work better together. And we, the covenant at the Catholic Climate Covenant, we're blessed to work with Sharon Levine and Rye St. James, along with Sister Diane Fangay of the Congregation of St. Joseph, to figure out ways that we can advance their cause and to provide economic opportunities beyond the uh, fossil fuel uh, job opportunities that are currently available to the community so that we can envision a thriving environmentally safe future for them. So what can we do and what can you do? And there are both individual and systemic things we can do. And we're seeing, especially with Dr. Sylvia's presentation that these are systemic problems. And as St. John Paul II said, every effort to protect and improve our world entails profound changes in lifestyles, models of production and consumption, and the established structures of power which today govern societies. We will not be perfect in these efforts. All of us can be found wanting in our efforts to strive to uphold the greatest commandment. But if we are blessed, to work together and we are blessed by the redemptive power of Christ to move forward. And if our needles, if the needles of our moral compasses are pointed in the right direction, then we can go in a good way together. And so when it comes specifically to helping assist and accompany communities suffering from environmental justice, I would recommend, but also wanna get a verification from my two colleagues that you think about the Hamas principles um, which were established in 1996 by the environmental justice community, and Hamas is spelled J-E-M-E-Z, um, and that is to allow the community leaders and the environmental justice communities to lead these efforts. We are to be accompanying and helping in the manner that they see fit. 
and to recognize that these are bottom-up efforts and that their needs are the ones that need to be prioritized. And I would also recommend that you reach out to the leaders in your Catholic community, whether they be Catholic college presidents, whether they be bishops, whether they be your pastors, to reach out and see where some of the environmental justice is happening in your areas and figure out ways in which, again, that you can assist these communities. We absolutely need the power, the moral authority of the Catholic Church to step into this. And through this, our entire society can be transformed through our faith. And as Chanel said, through our love and compassion for one another. And so let us go forth in a good way. Thank you for this time. I'm clapping on behalf of the Zoom community, who I know has been nourished by these um, reflections. We have a good uh, swath of time. Uh, we, will, uh, we will engage each other. I would like to encourage our viewers to, uh, if you have a question, go ahead and, and share it. I have many that I've been taking notes furiously, but I would, I would like to invite our panelists to kind of engage each other in this next little phase. And just what did you hear from your colleague, colleagues that moved, moved you or is moving in you? So uh, does anyone want to respond to that? Just what did you hear from, uh, you know, Dr. Sylvia or Chanel or Jose, depending on who you are, that really is moving your mind and your heart right now? Well, I would just say, Chanel, thank you for the um, the history of, of Africville. Oh my gosh, the the depth of the strength uh, and the adversity and the coming through of it. It was just so moving. And to know that there have been many African-American and African-Canadian communities that who have suffered in this way and yet have come out even stronger. So I just want to thank you for that witness. Yeah, I think in a very particular way, Africville kind of discloses how there's always um, a spatial dimension to environmental racism that we also need to attend to as well. Um, I want to thank both of you for sharing with us this evening. Just so rich, uh, such such rich reflections. Um, Jose, thank you for uh, identifying racism as like a failure to love neighbor. I think that's an important reframing. Um, and Dr. Sylvia, I wanna thank you for your reflections on the body. The body came up so much in your discussion, the body from conception to death and how that kind of helps us to rethink environmental racism as a life issue because it is an issue that interpolates our own flesh. Um, and so thank you for that. So thank you, thank you both. Thank you, Jose, and thank you, Chanel. Um, and thank you, Chanel, for um, talking about Africville. Um, I know in packing them in um, and in Echoes from the Poison Well, uh, those are deeper, uh, deeper um, discussions about history. Um, so when I did my PhD, uh, History of Science, Technology, and Environment, one of the things that emerged in our, in my training, uh, one of my colleagues said, history is written by the conquerors. And so that's why I was motivated to do a dissertation on the history of African-Americans and the history of uh, poor Eastern Europeans in Chicago, because that's usually not a history at that time that was written um, about and discuss. Um, and then I follow up with another um, paper, uh, another chapter in Michael Egan's uh, book, Natural Protest, Ball of Confusion. And again, we were talking about the first Earth Day. And this again was a lost history, but it's, a, it's history that's lost, but it's history as I pointed out earlier today, it's history that has environmental health implications. So that when we, take populations like African-Americans or poor whites or Hispanics, and we move them um, through redlining or we move them through extra legal processes into an unsustainable environment, the outcome is a destruction of life. 
And it's that history that you talk about. It's not just, and, it, and I think that's important what you said about this sense of community, but when it comes to environmental racism, it's the destruction, as Jose put out, pointed out, it's the destruction of God's creation. I mean, human beings, yes, he created the world in seven days, but we were his ultimate creation. And I remember growing up Catholic, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. So that when we engage in historical practices, which actually destroys the very fabric of humanity, we are attacking you know, the creator and we're attacking the people as Jose says, those greatest commandments is to love neighbor, right? So not only, you know, we're not loving our neighbor, but we're actually destroying humanity. And there is something that we both, that we all know, that's a grave sin, right? That's a grave sin to destroy a child in the room. And we were talking prior to this discussion, I said, imagine, imagine Mary living in Flint, Michigan, right? With Jesus in utero. So it's not, and I think that's, has, that has always been an issue for me as a, as a scientist and a Catholic and a person of color and a woman is that it's not just politics. It really comes down to the very fabric of life that is that um, that is at the core, the core cry of those suffering from environmental justice. That they're saying you're destroying me as a human being. And I remember when I did an epidemiology um, uh, survey on Chicago's South Side, and I know this uh, Cheryl Johnson will be here. I mean, I had a chance to see what polychlorinated biphenyls do to a human being. It's the first time I actually met a hermaphrodite, a person who, was, who had both sex organs. That came through because of this introduction of these uh, non-degrading chemicals into their water source, into their land. We're literally changing humanity. That's a grave sin. And that's what environmental racism is. It's a grave sin, it's an attack on humanity. Uh, which God in his infinite wisdom created us to be stewards, stewards of the earth. But we have to be stewards of each other. And I won't say much more after that. You know what's interesting, uh, Dr. Sylvia, because, um, you know, uh, Pope Francis, uh, his language in Laudato Si is that the, we're not hearing the cry of the earth. And, and it's, 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 it can be pretty Catholic if you think about it, because he's speaking in a sacramental way. Because in this tradition, things move through the finite. That's where the spirit is. And that's where, so if you hear the moan of creation, it's, it's one sacrament. The human person's another sacrament, but related so closely to the earth. So when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking of all kinds of things. I'm thinking of St. John Paul II, who was revolutionary in the environmental movement, Pope Benedict XVI, not a lot of folks know this. He's called the green Pope. And what did he do with Genesis in this language that we're talking about? He brought it back to St. Francis. He said, we, do, we should not read that Genesis as uh, human, as, you know, as dominion. So the stewardship is interesting, right? It's important. But he wants a more relational approach and a siblinghood like St. Francis articulates, a siblinghood of creation. Yeah, so, in so in chapter 30, Philadelphia, C, he says, our world has a grave social debt towards the poor who lack access to drinking water because they are denied the right to a life consistent with their inalienable dignity. That's a Laudato Si, yeah. right? So these basic human resources that we need, just like a plant needs water, right? And air, fresh air. A human being needs clean water, safe water, clean air. Just like children, right, who we think about children, our children playing outside, right? So if you go outside in an urban environment where they ran through transportation highways, through these 
minorities in poor areas. I did a study for a law firm and we found that the lead was not in the, was not in the paint. The lead was not in the house in its, higher, its highest proportion. The lead was in the soil where children played and were putting their hands to their mouth and consuming lead, totally innocent, right? They had nothing to do. Talk about history. Those children did not ask for a historical marginalized space, right? That was created because the very, the very forces that allowed redlining also were the very forces that allow industrialization in those neighborhoods, the creation of these transportation networks. So this memory, this history can't be decoupled to the current status of environmental health de degradation, right? So let me just say this much in terms of environmental genomics. So not only do we destroy the body, right? At this moment in time, this one snapshot in time, not only are we destroying the body at that moment, we're actually destroying the body for generations. Generation. So if I sub expose you to a chemical, I'm actually changing. Certain chemicals will change my DNA so that not only am I ill, but my child is ill and my grandchild is ill and my great-great-grandchild is ill. When they move out of those spaces or they reclaim Africville, right? But those who stayed, right, in these these degraded environments, not only have I changed my body in making that choice to be in community, but now I've also changed the bodies for four or five generations to come. How sinful is that, right? How sinful is that, that even if I was able to get that money to move out of that degraded space, right? And I move to this green space, this beautiful space. I am still carrying that, that destruction in my body, right? So yeah. it's, it's, it, this, is not, this is not just politics, right? Yeah. This is our core belief that in the sanctity of life, in the sanctity of life, no child should have to carry that burden. And no child should move out and find out later that, oh, we never had, and I hear, I used to hear this all the time. We never had these issues, these physical issues, these physical illnesses that you're talking about. We didn't have asthma in the rural South on the farm, right? We didn't have those issues. So, but we did have them when we migrated north into an urban environment that locked us into spaces that were the most polluted. So this is why I was so proud of the USCCB taking up this effort of environmental racism as a right to life issue because they understood that we were destroying bodies for generations. We were destroying God's creation. Well, let me jump in there because, and then I want to ask Chanel or, and Jose to um, weigh in because, and there's a question that will that will weave from the from the crowd, Chanel. But you know, you, it's a staggering insight you've given us, and it sounds to me like indigenous wisdom, maybe Catholic, as Catholic, you know, we think in generations. But American people today, we don't think in generations. You know, we don't, you know, we think in with the immediate and that that's one thing. So let's let's pull on history and memory. And let me give you a question, Chanel, from an anonymous um, attendee. Can Chanel speak a bit more about eco memory? Because I think we're we're connecting here to this as a counter memory that interrupts our collective memory and say how that works in Africville. And I'm so glad you shared the David Woods poem uh, because that, you know, what he's doing is like he's he's giving us a hope for, uh, how do you put it? A yellow house open like a womb. You know, it's a beautiful image and what has happened? And please, you know, speak to that if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind. And Jose, you can weigh in as well, please. Sure, thank you, Dr. Murphy. And thank you, Dr. Sylvia, again, for uh, unpacking the generational impacts of 
uh, this environmental crisis. Uh, in her text, Eco-Womanism, African-American Women and Earth-Honoring Faiths, which is this text right here, uh, which I would encourage people to purchase and read if you want a more in-depth understanding of eco-womanism, uh, Melanie Harris uh, kind of differentiates these terms. And she talks about eco-memories having the power to kind of counter uh, histories that erase um, the presence of Black communities in the telling of um, it, in the, the environmental legacy of whether it's the United States or Canada or wherever it might be. It's a form of kind of say, interjecting and saying like, no, we are here. No, this is the heritage that I've inherited from my family. And so it's really this reclaiming of narrative as well as what I would add here. Um, as a discourse in and of itself, eco-womanism really does center the um, lived experiences of women of African descent, but it's also very much um, an interfaith um, and an interdisciplinary discourse as well. Um, and then I think in terms of uh, Africville, looking at poetry is always one example of, you know, what does it mean to, to think through the continual implications of memory for one. Uh, there's also a documentary called Remembering Africville that was made in 1991 uh, by the National Film Board of Canada that goes in more deep, deeply with these issues as well. Uh, wonderful, thank you. Jose, do you have any, what's moving in your mind, my friend, anything? Uh, nothing more to add on this, uh, Chanel. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm seeing this. I'm just going to pick some things out as we go here. But Edward Dal Dalmau from our Q&A, uh, he's looking, he wants a reference bibliography from us. So maybe we can provide some books after this and we'll post it on our webpage. We will do that, Edward. Um, I want to go up here to maybe back to you, Chanel. What got you interested, Chanel? And all can speak about this, I think. What got us interested in environmental racism, particularly? Chanel, we'll go to you first, and then Jose, maybe you can respond to that. And then Dr. Sylvia, if you have a thought, uh, thank you. I'm very curious to hear what my other panelists have to say. Um, you know, personally, I um, am a vegetarian. I have been for a very long time now. And so I've always kind of lived in a way that uh, aligned with the rhythms of the earth. And so I think that there was a part of me that always uh, cared about non-human kin period. Um, but I think that in terms of my research, I have a deep interest in theological anthropology. But as I think about um, our human community, um, how we are, a, a, you know, a growing a society that's growing in understanding of different ways of knowing, different ways of being. I'm recognizing that, you know, we have to also consider the implications of theological anthropology for the rest of the world also. What does it mean to stretch the boundaries of this discourse? And so it's something that I'm continually growing with and also recognizing how there were seeds of this type of theology in my life and practices of gardening. I think that there's something really rich about um, eco-womanism in particular that invites us to kind of excavate our own eco stories as resources for how we do our um, academic and theological work. Yeah, thank you, Chanel. Jose, you have any, how about you? What, you know, you have rich experience working with indigenous peoples. Um, what would, you know, what, what moves you to do your work at Catholic Climate Covenant? Um, well, I, I'll just say that, um, a while ago, I used to work for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and uh, you know we were picking up on the momentum from the United Church of Christ report with regard to environmental racism back in the late 80s, uh, and that led to further exploration of, of environmental justice across the board, including with Native American tribes, and a good percentage, something like 60% or more of the Superfund sites in America are located on or near Indian reservations. So the depth of the, of the crisis of the contamination, whether it be African-American, Hispanic or Native American communities or Native American tribal governments is extraordinary. Um, it is extraordinary. Um, so, you know, it has always been a, either a passion of mine or something I've always been keeping a, 
tabs on and uh, you know based on you know what I said earlier and what we've all said earlier with regard to this being a fundamental Christian obligation, um, we at the Catholic Climate Covenant want to step more into it now and we're really blessed to work with Sharon Levine of Rise St. James to in one of the most pivotal issues right now uh, in the environmental justice community. So if we can we can help change, the dynamic there, then, you know, perhaps that will be um, a, a presidential, you know, earth, earth shaking transformational, transformational change um, on this issue. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Sylvia, what do you think? Oh, you're just, you're on mute. Say, Restate the question, please. I was answering questions in the chat. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, what got you in, interested in environmental racism? I mean, really, you, you've written on it, but do you remember what first moved you to that? Was it your upbringing in Ohio? Was it something that happened? When did the kind of light go on for you? So the light sort of went on for me. I was in the middle of my PhD. Um, and I was teaching, I was a professor, uh, a STEM professor, and a student brought it to my attention because I was talking about the environment and uh, just understanding about toxicity because I knew as an environmental engineer that, that all environmental regulations was coming out of a need to protect public health. A lot of people were like, so it's like, what I says, environmental legislation was due to public health. So a student brought it to my attention. So have you heard about environmental racism? And so I looked deeper and I literally switched my, my PhD topic for my yeah. dissertation. A student introduced me to it. And I was a little shocked at that the phraseology of environmental racism because it was something that had been happening and my parents had discussed it because they came from farming communities of the deep south. They were constantly complaining about um, environmental pollution in their neighborhoods. So um, there was just a given that if you were in a black, living in a black community, you were gonna have higher, a higher probability of waste being put in your backyard. Wow. So my student, he brought it to my attention is like, okay, but that's a known fact. <laughs> so what are we talking about? Uh, and that's how I got into it because it, it really is part of the memory of, uh, and, I, and I think Echoes in the Poison Well, uh, I have a chapter in that edited collection called Wading in the Water. Mm. Um, and, and in that one, I talk about how uh, African-American communities, even though they pay taxes uh, to have water infrastructure, they never receive it. They never receive sewage infrastructure or, or uh, flooding infrastructure. And I think that led to my uh, getting a National Science Foundation grant um, called Engineering Infrastructures and Environmental uh, Health Disparities by NSF yeah. um, and, and tracking that because it was just it was just a given that you were not going to have the same environmental resources um, in well, environmental gets, protection. This gets to a question that's came in. So like the question is an an anonymous attendee who asked, please explain the inclusion of restorative justice in the title of the session. So we've, we've diagnosed, we've put a light on years of inequality and unequal impact. What tools of restorative justice can we put into play for you know, the Superfund uh, you know, onslaught to uh, Native American reservations to the disproportionate amount of housing and industrialized zones and cities, what restorative justice can we do? How do you think about that question? I need to stop talking. <laughs> I, yeah. I, want, I, want, I want the others yeah. to talk. <laughs> it takes a second to land because it's a big question, but you know, and, and we can sit with it for a second, but what moves in you when you hear that question about restorative justice, which is a particular kind of justice? Well, I'll be, you know, I'll be frank. It's, 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 it's nearly overwhelming. It's, it's multidimensional in its, uh, in its manifestation, you know, from, you know, the individual acts of, of racism to, for example, some of the uh, environmental justice issues that I've been a part of. 
I'm not going to name communities, but I, th there are some familiar patterns here. And the patterns are you've got local governmental officials who are supportive of a polluting industry because they've been dependent upon it. You've got the state also supportive of it. You've got their congressional legislators supportive of it. You've got billions of dollars in so-called incentives uh, coming from you know these polluting uh, in these polluting industries. It's just pile upon pile of adverse influences of money and political influence. So when we're talking about restorative justice, it is it is trying to unpeel every single one of those. Um, and but again, to go back to the source, it, it is to start with that community and working with them to do that on peeling. Um, so yeah, it's huge. Thank you, Jose. Chanel, did you have a thought on that? Yes, very briefly, I think I would say uh, that it's a question that deserves a lot of unpacking as Jose mentioned. Um, immediately what came to mind was um, the place for apologies. You know, in 2010, the municipality of Halifax apologized to the residents and descendants of Africville. Um, but we, I think, you know, as, as important as apologies are, we should always recognize that they don't necessarily fix intergenerational pain and trauma. And so sitting with that. Let me interject and then maybe Sylvia, you can, you can come back in because it seems like such a natural fit for, for uh, the Catholic Church to be uh, blunt and, and Christianity to um, to react to this care of the earth in profound ways and to care profoundly for creation. You know, this is a faith and reason tradition after all. And the reason part is that you know all these climate deniers, like you know, we've been well out the door there. It's 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 irrefutable that we are we are in um, climate catastrophe for for very real scientific reasons. But it's also a faith tradition, right? That you know that can bring tools to it. But yet it seems like, and there's a question from here in the, in the Q&A, everybody, why, how come the USCCB is not doing anything about racism in terms of the synod, right? And it's not doing anything about, there was a great, art, a great piece in the 80s on race, uh, but and it's not doing much, like the, in the parishes, our environmental, like Laudato Si theology is running up against a wall, as is some of the synodal stuff. So what is going on here? It's a perfect fit. Uh, we love St. Francis, but why can't we do what's right in front of us? Are we paralyzed? Are we in denial? What's going on here? How do you think about that? Sylvia, please. Um, I think restorative justice, um, one of the things that happened this year was the Build Back Better plan under Joe Biden and this replacement of lead piped, right? How do we get communities back to health. Um, and I think we need these engineering solutions. And I am an engineer. Um, that's the scientific side of it, um, to move people away from, like there was like incredible community efforts to bring fresh water to the Flint, Michigan community. Um, but we need to, I think, and I guess I am a scientist, I admit to that in a historian, we need to stop the continuing degradation of the human body. And we do that by impact, uh, implementing engineering solutions, uh, implementing uh, environmental education, which is what we try to do with the Claver Grant. We try to inform people, right, about what was happening to their bodies. And if people don't know, they can't make decisions. They can't be restored to health. Um, I, think it, I think there are some really concrete steps we need to do to protect God's creation. Um, I, and, and just, I'll say this one other thing, because I know I'm, I'm a chatty cat. <laughs> uh, I am chatty. Um, I think that, I think people are more comfortable with non-scientific discourse, right? I think it makes people very uncomfortable because people are tired of talking about racism, right? <laughs> In my household, people don't wanna hear about racism anymore. People are fatigued um, and people feel oppressed. 
Um, the, 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 the distinction here with environmental racism is that it causes so much destruction of humanity, the very core of humanity. So I'm gonna stop there because it's not political. I'm a scientist, this is science. Asthma rates, yeah. those are that high. Look, look at That's the numbers. Yeah, yeah, look at the graphs you, you posted for us, right? They're right there before your eyes. Good, but um, okay, that's, thank you. Uh, Jose, let me kind of drill drill down on this one though with the USCCB. So many friends in the USCCB, S Sylvia had great experiences in making her film. We're gonna see a clip in a minute, but what do you think the impediment is for them today? You work with them, I know but there's lots of people who cooperate and who are supportive, but then there's also uh, these walls. How do you think about that, Jose? Well, that question, uh, wow, that, that can't be unpacked in um, a couple yeah. minutes. Um, wow. Um, yeah, sorry. No, that's okay. I mean, yeah. we, you know, one of the themes, you know, I started with is like, what is our Christian duty? And let us all come together in that. And you, you suggested this earlier, Michael, that, you know, we do have within our church processes by which we can come together across difference. I mean, what does pontiff mean, but bridge building? Yeah. Why don't we take those, uh, why don't we take those processes and use them for some of the most contentious issues within our church, like to let us define pro-life to be much more expansive than, you know, many make it to be, you know, let us work across the aisles. We need to start with our faith and again, you know, our respect for each other and then talk openly, candidly, constructively, respectfully, gracefully about these differences. I mean, that is the start uh, of how we get to the issue. Um, you know, with regard to collective responses, um, with regard to the USCCB or just our Catholic Church writ large, we know that we are losing young people. We also know that young people care deeply about creation and climate change. And if we as a church are not going to address these in a forthright way, we're going to continue to hemorrhage membership. So if we want to be relevant, then we need to be working on these issues. I couldn't agree more. It's the most original thing we've ever, you know, it's the first book of the Bible. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, if you're going to be biblical about it. Chanel, do you have one thought before we show a clip? Anything you want to say? Um, no, just that I am so grateful for Laudato Si for really opening up this conversation that bridges uh, a multidisciplinary conversation with the church and the sciences and the world and folks of other faiths. Yeah, I thank you. I agree. Uh, there were some questions that were answered. In a, I think by our staff, but I do want to just read the most, everything's been cleared on my screen. So I, I see one more. I just want to read it out loud. This is just, uh, let's not respond, but let it sink into our hearts. We are talking about environmental racism, but this is a byproduct. This is from an anonymous attendee, by the way. Uh, this is a byproduct of quote, systemic racism and white supremacy. So perhaps it's important to recall that, right? We had the Jesuits admit that they had slaves enslaved people, let me, let me add, a, sorry, I'll editorialize, uh, and now are trying to pervade, provide some reparations. Are there environmental sins that religious communities need to apologize for? Does the institutional church employ environmentally sustainable practices? You know, that is a great question and you're gonna find a mixed bag. I think it's a good link though, because now we're gonna see a clip and you'll see some, you'll see a connection this is the uh, St. Peter Claver funded film Dr. Sylvia Hood Washington and others made right about 16, 17 years ago. It's called Struggles for Environmental Justice and Health in Chicago, African-American and Catholic Perspectives. Ahead of its time, let me show you about three and a half minutes, then we'll, we'll conclude a little bit with some reflection. So here we go, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna push my buttons. And I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do this. Not one of us in the United States really bears the equitable burden of pollution. We dump our waste in areas where the poor can't refuse it. Right now on the south side of Chicago, there's so many incinerators and so many waste facilities 
that the American Public Health Association says no more should be built, but they continue to be built. Garbage is trucked in from all over eastern United States to the south side of Chicago. In our scripture, it talks about, in Deuteronomy, it says, God said, I set before you life and death. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. How can you choose life when all around you, there are barriers stopping you to, from doing that? How can you do that when you're not, maybe not allowed to go in particular areas? Or when industry may say, well, this area has a group of people that really uh, does not have a lot of money, that really is worrying more about their day-to-day -day survival. So they're not going to be worried about the fact that we're putting uh, an industry here that may be a dumping place, because they want to get a job. Well before the modern environmental movement, um, plant managers and owners always knew that they should live upwind and upstream of their plants. In contrast, one of the things that happens to working class people whose jobs depend on local industries is that they tend to live next to those industries, usually because of the cost of housing and the difficulty of transportation. And so they're really stuck between their livelihood and their lives. and oil refining processes are some of the most dangerous polluters exist. And here you have Cargill, industrial oils, lubricants, and salts. We learned that our community area should have never been a residential area from the beginning because it was located in an industrial zone. Okay, this is all Gail Grimes. This is where I've been living all my life. Over 40 years, I've been living in this community. Make a left. Altgeld Gardens is located in a part of Chicago that's south of the historic Pullman factory town. In the late 1800s, they piped all of their industrial effluent to a remote location. And then in the early part of the 1900s, other industries came and used this property in a similar way. Everyone knows about the historical contamination in Altgeld. We have 50 documented landfill, four that's currently operate in operation today. We have one of the county's largest sewage treatment operations. That means everything that comes out of our residential, commercial, industrial, raw sewage is laid out in our community to be processed. We have chemical companies, we have four motor companies, we have different types of manufacturing companies. Okay, uh, you see Cheryl Johnson there, uh, who will be our speaker on Friday in the session that Curl is hosting, our Center for Urban Research and Learning. That's a wonderful connection. Uh, panel, we're moving toward the end here. An amazingly prophetic film that really distills what's happening. What do you think seeing this film? Uh, I'll start with you, Chanel, just a kind of a short reaction as we move to close. I wish I could see the whole film. Um, I think it just offers this insight into lived experiences on the ground. What struck me was the line that said, we should have never been like zoned as a residential area. Um, and just kind of thinking with that, that landscape is something that I'm gonna take away. Thank you, Chanel. Jose, how about you? Uh, it's exceptionally sobering to know that this is still going on there and across the country and the world. Yeah, I agree. Uh, people are asking about this. So Dr. Sylvia and I, it's, you can get this film in the library, it's still out there, but it's, um, we're trying to bring it back into circulation. So I just, I just, I moved it over to digital and we got to see about copyrights, but I want to put it on our webpage. So if you're wondering, I got to make sure it's okay with everybody. So Dr. Sylvia, we'll talk about that, but we, we need to have this film back in circulation. Um, how do you feel about it, Dr. Sylvia? 
you know, looking at that clip again after, you know, some time I would, I would imagine. I'm, I'm just glad that you invited me to be your speaker and that we connected and that you're making this effort to get this back in circulation. I don't think anything has dramatically changed. Um, and maybe this is, this is a point in time that we can be more proactive. I, I think it's still, um, I mean, I was on the Environmental Justice Commission for the state of Illinois and the Illinois EPA uh, Environmental Justice Chair for almost, for almost 15 years. And really not much has changed. Wow. You know, I don't know. I, I really just sort of, I've been praying a lot on this because of the, of the pandemic that we could listen and be taught that this time might teach us something. I'm, I'm glad, Chanel, you read a poem. If you've watched our Hank Center events before, you know, I like to always include a, a poem. This is Amanda Gorman, who I think is a Catholic. I'm not sure, but I think she's, I think she's, a, she may, you know, it's hard to say these days, <laughs> uh, but she's a creature of, of the loving and living God in my, in my faith tradition. So, but she's a beautiful poet and she has this, these sequences she does that are called arborescence. They're, a, they're so they're tree, they're, they're, they're tree invoking. So here's a poem to close and then um, I'll thank you all. So this one's called Arborescent Three or Elpis. And she says that, and she, and the poet writes, and the poet speaks this. Let us rephrase, for we'll say it right this time. And isn't that what endings are for? We do not hope for no reason. Hope is the reason for itself. We don't care for our beloveds for any specific singular logic, but rather for the whole of them. That is to say, love is justified by loving. Like you, we are haunted and human. You, like us, are haunted and healing. What we feel to be true can only be understood by what it does to the body. The same as trees. We too are shaped by how we twist toward all that shoots us through with sun. We truly are growing up and out of this hurt if we'd rather char than chain this love. Our only word for this is change. Amen. I wish blessings on, I want to thank our panel. I want to thank you, Dr. Sylvia. Thank you, Dr. Or Jose Guto, counselor. Thank you, future doctor, future Dr. Chanel. <laughs> and thank, thank you all viewers for being here. Thanks for all the questions. And we're going to get this film up, but uh, I wish you a pleasant good night. And thanks for tuning in to uh, our session. And please continue to watch uh, and join the Climate Change Conference, such an important conference. I want to thank Dr. Nancy Tuckman and her team, and I wish you a pleasant good night, one and all.